a world and a heaven into which his super abundance might flow. What's important here, he did not create out of need, but out of wealth. Out of super abundance. You could say it would almost be, in a sense, a perfect parent adopting a child. They do not adopt the child from some state of misery and poverty so that the child might add something to their life as much as they adopt this child out of misery and poverty to pour forth their blessing into the child's life. They have no need. The child can offer them nothing. But they bring the child into their life to pour themselves into the child. God had no need. Had no need. Do you see how much blasphemy and false doctrine can be taught just in nursery rhyme books? And, and Christian parents trying to say what they think to be quaint things to their children? Mommy, why did God make me? Oh, because he was lonely. No. Never. Now, and the Word was God. This is an undeniable declaration of the Word's deity. In the original Greek, the phrase is literally, and God was the Word. The predicate God precedes the subject, the Word, in order to emphasize the fact that the Word was really and truly God. The Son of God is God the Son. There are so many people, listen to me, who will say Jesus is the Son of God. Oh, they will say it. But, to, but they will not say Jesus is God the Son. The fullness of deity dwells in Him. John Gill writes, The Son was not made a God as he is said hereafter to be made flesh, nor constituted or appointed a God, or a God by office, but truly and properly God in the highest sense of the word. Now, this is very important. He was not made a God. Because this would suggest that there was a time when he was not a God. Or was not God. And to use this type of language is absolutely absurd anyways. For a God to have to be made is no God at all. All right? Nor was he constituted or appointed a God. Many sects, many um, cults, we use this type of language. He was appointed a God. Or that he was a God by office. See, in both cases, what they're doing is avoiding dealing with nature. Because the question is, is he by nature God? but truly and properly God in nature, the fullness of deity in the highest sense of the word. Now again, why is this so important? Well, you wouldn't think it a big deal if I took you to lunch, but you would think it a bigger deal if a king or a president took you to lunch. You must have an exalted, which is a biblical view of the person of Jesus of Nazareth before you can appreciate what he has done for you on the cross of Calvary. It's absolutely essential. Now, Albert Barnes writes, There is no more unequivocal declaration in the Bible than this. And there could be no stronger proof that the sacred writer meant to affirm that the Son of God was equal with the Father. There is no evidence that John intended to use the word God in an inferior sense. It is not the word was a God or the word was like God, but the word was God. He had just used the word God as evidently applicable to Jehovah, the true God, and it is absurd to suppose that he would, in the same verse, and without any indication that he was using the word in an inferior sense, employ it to denote a being altogether inferior to the true God. 
goes on and says, This truth is absolutely essential to the Christian faith in our understanding of the gospel. It is only when we realize the fullness of the Son's deity that we can begin to appreciate the value of His incarnation and death. It was not a creature, but the Creator who came down and died upon a tree. This is absolutely necessary. See, sometimes what we'll do is we'll segregate doctrines. And this is where we'll end today. We'll say, well, Jesus is God. Okay, got that. Um, Jesus died a bloody death for our redemption. Got that. Jesus is our high priest. Uh, Jesus is the um, object of our faith. All those are true doctrines. But you must see how they link together. And how quickly, if one of them falls, all of them fall. If Jesus is not God, if He's not, He cannot be our Redeemer. If He is not God, then our High Priest, you really going to trust Him? Are you willing to hang everything you are on a peg that is less than God? Spurgeon said, if our Redeemer had been an archangel, we would have something to worry about. And if he had been a man, we would simply have to sit down in absolute despair. But he was God. He was God. You see, that's why the Jehovah Witnesses have to bypass him. And say that they are trusting in Yahweh or Jehovah or whatever name they use. They don't speak much of trust in Christ. And their own fallacy is exposed. They can't put much trust in Christ if he's just a man or just a demagogue or something between an angel and a man or an angel and God. He must be God to be worthy of our confidence. Of our confidence. And he is. He is. The one who reigns in heaven, who has taken our nature upon himself, is God of gods, King of kings, and Lord of lords. And in him we can trust. And for those of you who are fathers, you can not only entrust yourself to him, you can entrust your children to him. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your kindness to us. Lord, we pray that this day your kingdom will advance. Your name will be considered holy. Your will will be done. In Jesus' name, amen.